going. So um, my name is Maxine Hunter. I'm the UF IFAS Extension Agent in uh, Marion County, and I take care of residential horticulture agents, pesticide applicators, and also manage the Master Gardener program. Um, on board with us today, we also have Amanda Merrick, who is our Florida Friendly Landscaping Agent, and also our UF Extension Intern, Ms. Terilyn Plumley. So um, welcome aboard, guys, and I hope you enjoy the information. We have a lot of information to get through today. Our topic for today is living with Florida wildlife, and today we're going to cover mammals. So this is part of a um, series of presentations. We also can do uh, tortoises, alligators, specifically black bears, um, and some of our other keystone species that live in Florida with us. So, um, but today I thought we would focus specifically on mammals. So a little bit about Florida's wildlife and why this is so important that we talk about it and um, you know, think conservatively about our wildlife populations here. Florida has the third most diverse wildlife population of any state in the US. Hunting, fishing, and outdoor recreation have an economic impact of 10.1 billion annually. Um, this does include watchable wildlife, so bird watching and other activities that are associated with this. Um, obviously, during COVID-19, some of the outdoor recreation is some of the best items that we have access to right now. So um, we're looking forward to continuing this, and it's very important to our um, ecosystem. Next, urban landscapes can provide habitat for wildlife, um, and we're going to talk just a tiny bit about that today. We're not really going to get too much into the Florida-friendly landscaping uh, for wildlife portion, but we will touch on it. So a little more about Florida's wildlife before we move into landscaping is there are over 700 terrestrial animals. Florida is one of the most uh, richest species in the nation as far as wildlife goes. And Florida's wildlife, 44% um, or more are declining due to habitat loss. And this number is going up um, exponentially as we continue to have people move into the state. Um, we are one of the most uh, populous states that's growing quickly. So roughly a thousand people a day are moving into Florida each day right now. So granted, that number was before we had the coronavirus come through. So that could be a little different right now. But I imagine once things stabilize again, um, the moving into Florida isn't going to stop. And in Marion County, we're in the heart of it. So we're just slightly north of the villages and we've got on top of the world. We're in one of the heaviest um, growing metropolis areas right now. Um, so we're really in a transition period of going from about 50% rural area into a much more urban environment. And this is really important to notate for our wildlife. And um, with each new resident that moves in, it is estimated that a half acre of wildlife habitat is cleared and destroyed. So that doesn't mean that um, each person that moves in has a half acre lot. What that means is that to account for the space that they need, that may include grocery stores, other buildings, commercial buildings, roadways. So roughly one half acre per person that moves into our state is destroyed. So some types of wildlife that we see in Florida, first of all, we have a huge um, variety of birds. If you're interested in bird watching, we have both migratory and non-migratory bird species. Um, some of the lesser favorite wildlife are reptiles and amphibians, and I do a lot of talks on snakes um, and also sometimes alligators, turtles, um, or frogs or lizards, whatever is requested. Um, like I said, people seem to be a bit more squirmish over the reptiles and amphibians, but hopefully we can, you know, help educate them that they do play a role in our ecosystem and actually can be really beneficial. We have a huge assortment of freshwater and saltwater fish. Obviously, our water resources here in the state of Florida are second to none. And then um, what is less notated sometimes are our mammal species. And again, that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, a lot of our mammals do function primarily at night, so you may not see them as much during the day, and so they get a little bit less recognition. Um, and then lastly, we won't go in today, but insects and invertebrates, so both pollinators and butterflies are beneficial insects, and even some marine invertebrates. So um, that's just a basic overview of what we have here. One of the key components to Florida is Florida has more natural ecosystems 
um, and habitat types than any other state. We have over 80 distinct ecosystems. A few examples of these include hardwood hammocks, xeric hammocks, pine flatwoods, sand hills, scrub ecosystems, coastal dunes, freshwater and saltwater wetlands, mangrove swamps, uh, dry and wet prairies, and then our lake river estuarine and uh, marine habitats. So each one of these habitats provides resources for different wildlife, and many of these wildlife are specific only to the state of Florida. They're not found anywhere else in the world. So that's pretty cool. And um, like I said, these ecosystems are very unique, and I highly encourage you, if you're not familiar with them, um, take a look out and uh, go check out what's out there. So there's some pretty neat stuff. If you are planning to try to attract wildlife to your home, there are some basics, the same basic needs that we have. Um, food, water, cover, and space. Of these resources, uh, space is the most difficult to obtain for wildlife. Um, cover can come from the landscape and obviously water can be either natural or artificial sources such as bird baths or small ponds. Um, and then lastly, the reason that we normally get nuisance wildlife calls is generally over food. Um, food resources are a big deal for wildlife and they get into habits that are not always what we expected or what we thought we would be attracting and we'll talk a little bit about that today but we're going to do uh, nuisance wildlife in two weeks. So principles of wildlife landscapes. First of all we talked about food being the number one problem when we talk about um, nuisance wildlife. So um, some examples of this, you might have uh, fruit trees or even leftover fruit that you didn't use out of your kitchen. Um, fruit can include berries on trees such as hollies, um, palm trees, um, date palms, etc., and other plants that we might not actually use, usually utilize. So um, it's not always in direct competition with us. However, I will tell you, we often get complaints if people do have fruit trees, whether it be plums, peaches, or other, with wildlife getting into that fruit. That certainly is very common. Uh, seeds and berry production is also very um, attractive to wildlife. So trying to plant, if you're looking to get wildlife involved, all right, hopefully I don't mess this up, there we go. Um, these are great ways to do it. If you're gonna look into adding water resources, adding bird baths, or like I said, small outdoor ponds, whether it be um, a koi pond or even a hand dug pond, the sound of water as well as the appearance of water will always attract wildlife because that is one of their um, needs. Fountains also work. And then lastly, cover and protection for um, all animals and including nesting space. And one thing that we see that people don't often realize is birds occasionally, depending on the species, will nest in the lower portion of shrubs. So you've got to take care when you're pruning different species that you don't accidentally disturb their nest. Um, hummingbirds are a good example of this, but there's many other bird species out there that will nest in the lower four foot of a shrub. Um, trees and um, trees and shrubs of varying heights, so you get some vertical layering in there for protection is really important if you want to attract wildlife. Uh, birdhouses can be good, but how are you going to keep them clean? Make sure you have a plan for that. Um, all urban landscapes can be altered and maintained to create habitat for wildlife. So um, you know, don't fear that you don't have enough space. You can protect wildlife in your own backyard with the correct uh, modifications. So trying to resemble natural habitat types in your area is a good way to attract wildlife. Um, there can be specific areas within individual landscapes, so it doesn't have to all be wildlife landscape um, or wildlife friendly. And then of course we highly recommend when we work with our HOAs having natural spaces that are left in neighborhoods. Um, this is really beneficial for Habitat for Wildlife. And what this does, these natural spaces allow for them to have almost like a small corridor to move around and travel to find the resources that they need without being found on the highway or in other areas where they get themselves into trouble. So um, native landscapes can be beautiful and functional. 
They don't have to be all native. We again recommend Florida friendly landscaping, but we, we do like natives too. So there's lots of options out there. And this is just a nice example of a habitat that's gonna um, provide some space for wildlife and is still appealing uh, both aesthetically and to the homeowner. So one of the things you may notice in this picture is there's a very small amount of lawn space. So um, you don't have to have a ton of lawn um, and be able to diversify your landscape to support wildlife. That's being supported more and more by communities. So um, there are actually some grants available for several different reasons um, to help you modify your um, landscape if you have a lot of lawn space. So we're gonna move on into mammals. We just wanted to give you a little background information there. Um, and when we start talking about mammals, some of the things that we're gonna talk about are human interactions and concerns, common wildlife species that we see here in Central Florida, um, specifically mammals. We're not gonna get into the reptiles and amphibians. Um, we'll talk a little bit about dealing with unwanted wildlife specifically in regards to the each individual mammal we discuss. Um, and then lastly, a little bit on our resource for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, um, also known as FWC. And if you're not familiar with their F, uh, website, their website is myfwc.com. And it is a fantastic resource. So don't be afraid to reach out to them um, on their website. Again, they have superb resources available. Um, in fact, a lot of the information that is on this slideshow came from uh, their website. So again, they have one of our few government websites that's really outstanding. So are you here today because you're having issues with wildlife? This is something we get a lot of calls on. Um, personally, um, I love dealing with wildlife issues because there's often some very creative ways to um, handle them without harming the wildlife and appeasing the homeowner. So a quick example of that is I got a call a couple weeks ago from a woman who was um, on a golf course property was where her home was and she was having issues with sandhill cranes in her backyard eating her furniture so um, that was definitely not good and uh, we were able to resolve that she put up a temporary hot wire um, type fence so um, they did go away they've changed their patterns and hopefully uh, another six months or so and she can remove that temporary hot wire but um, you've got to find ways to deter them. So what other types of problems with wildlife issues have you had? Uh, could include landscape issues where they're eating your trees or shrubs, um, aesthetic issues, economic issues, and even health risk and disease. Um, one of the first things that you have to do when dealing with wildlife is determine what species you're dealing with. Correct identification is key to a successful management plan. Um, and some of the things that you may need to look for are scat or wildlife poop, sorry, but um, that is essential in identification, especially if you're working with an animal that's uh, coming out at night, so you may not see the actual animal. Tracks, mounds or holes, and then specifics on the damaged vegetation, and we'll go into the damaged vegetation uh, quite a bit more during our uh, nuisance wildlife talk. So, First mammal that we're gonna talk about is the nine-banded armadillo. And I'd like to uh, state this once, and I'll probably state it a few more times. Do not touch the wildlife. Um, there are specific reasons for this. One, um, you could get bit or scratched. Two would be diseases. So with the nine-banded armadillo, specifically, leprosy is an issue, and um, we don't want to have anyone that has issues with that. So. Um, believe it or not, we do have roughly a dozen cases of leprosy here in the state of Florida each year. Um, so leprosy is a big problem when it comes to um, our health department because they're the ones that handle this. And these leprosy cases do come from people who actually handle or even try to eat armadillos. Armadillos are a food time um, of the past. So. Um, armadillos are a prehistoric looking animal that belong to a family of mammals found primarily in Central and South America. These are an invasive species here, however they um, have become naturalized so we don't really consider them as an invasive anymore. Uh, adults normally weigh around 8 to 17 pounds and have a lifespan of 7 to 20 years. 
These species occur in Texas and throughout the southeast. And cold weather limits the northern boundary of the armadillo's range. So, and on another quick note, armadillos generally breed in late July and their um, young are born in February or March. So you may see young armadillos running around this time of year that are only a few months old. They do have one litter per year with almost always four young. Their typical habitat includes uh, dense shady cover such as brush, woodland, or pine forest. They prefer sandy or loamy soils that are relatively easy to excavate because that's generally the complaint we get. Um, and they typically rest in deep burrows during the day and are active late evenings and at night and early morning. They burrow under brush piles, stumps, rock piles, dense brush, and even concrete patios. Generally their burrows are seven to eight inches in diameter and can be up to 15 foot long. Their burrows differ from a gopher tortoise burrow in that they are usually very um, symmetrically round. Also, this is a challenge for us when we're trying to manage them. They often have several burrows throughout their territory. Um, so you may be treating one burrow or trying to trap them out of one burrow and they may just relocate to another burrow until they, you decide that it's a waste of your time. So some diseases, uh, nine-banded armadillos are generally remarkably free of parasites, um, and they have never been diagnosed with our, um, rabies. But um, we did have leprosy in 1971. They were able to verify that um, in a cap captive armadillo. And again, we do have cases here every year in Central Florida. So again, that's something that goes through the Florida Department of Health. Um, leprosy in wild armadillos is reported at rates of um, one half percent to 10% in Florida, Louisiana, Texas, Mississippi, and Mexico. So please do not touch the wildlife. All right, last little bit on uh, armadillos. First of all, they're a, one of the most common victims of highway mortality. Um, they have an instinctive response to jump upwards when startled and um, this might be effective at lunging away from a predator, but it does not help them um, lunge away from vehicles. So also many of them are killed by um, domestic dogs and even coyotes. So these animals primarily feed on insects, which is why we generally get calls about them, either because their burrows are somewhere where they cause concern or else they are digging up someone's lawn. Um, they generally eat earthworms, scorpions, spiders, snails, and small vertebrate. Um, and again, they like to feed at night when that lawn is moist and these insects will come to the surface. Um, we get reports of armadillo damage to bird nests. Um, and generally people can't appreciate the fact that these animals actually do help concern, um, consume pest insects, including armyworms, cockroaches, ants, wasps, flies, beetles, and grasshoppers. So there is a benefit to them, but if it's in your front lawn, you may not appreciate the fact that they're digging it up. So these um, armadillos have actually been known to dig up entire yellow jacket nests, which is pretty incredible, because if you've ever been in contact with yellow jackets, they are just horrible, nasty wasps. So, um, and Again, they generally find their food by rooting or digging in ground litter, um, but they will occasionally eat mushrooms or berries. Moving on, we'll talk a little bit about Florida bats. Uh, bats are really neat, and here in the state of Florida, we have 18 different species in three different families. Um, so a huge variety of bats, and these guys are in very declining numbers. Each species is um, highly unique and they are very well adapted to catch uh, flying insects at night. So we don't generally see them in the day. You'll see them very early mornings and late evenings. They will feed on mosquitoes, but not as a primary food source. That is not their first choice. They use their wings and the skin around their tail and their mouths to catch the insects while they're in flight. And if you've never seen a bat um, feeding, it is very, very neat to watch. So they're incredibly fast animals. Um, you can go out if you have a light pole at, outside of your home, 
um, with flying insects around it. And very often, if you sit out there and just watch and wait, you will be able to see them. If you don't have bats in your neighborhood, you can go to the Florida Bat House on the University of Florida campus, or there's several bat conservancies in the state that um, often have exhibits that you can see. Most of these bats locate their food through um, and navigate through continuous sounds, which are uh, called echolocations. So these are ultrasonic cries that echo off of solid objects. That's one of the very unique characteristics of bats. And bats are the only mammals that are capable of true flight. So um, there are not other mammals that are capable of this, although I have heard of people's raccoons getting into their bird feeders and they consider them flying animals sometimes. So, but bats are definitely the only ones that are capable of flight. Most Eastern species of bats produce one young per year. Um, however, several species do produce two and there is one species of bat that produces up to four, but obviously um, with them only producing one young per year, this is not going to be beneficial to their reproduction stance and their population numbers. You can have a colony of female bats that group together to make a nursery before they have their young. That's pretty neat. So they actually work in collaboration to support um, the baby bats, which is really interesting. The next mammal we're going to talk about is a little bit larger. It's the Florida back black bear. This is one we do occasionally get complaints on. It's becoming more and more frequent in central Florida. The Florida black bear's habitat is uh, forested areas with dense understory and uh, thick vegetation. Even in penetratable swamps um, are ideal um, distribution and demographics for the black bear include um, getting into these swamps. So they have a huge home range. So they need access to a variety of habitats that provide a variety of foods. Obviously these are large mammals, so they eat quite a bit more than the smaller mammals. Um, and also during different seasons, they have different caloric intake um, requirements. Their diet includes um, eat meat and plants, and uh, they need an average of 11 to 18 pounds of food per day. So when you think about 11 to 18 pounds of food per day, and you think about the size of berries on certain plants like holly trees or beauty berry, um, that's a lot of berries. So obviously it takes a lot of diversity to get them where they're um, full. They feed on any type of succulent or nutritious vegetation, including the tubers and bulbs of plants, berries, nuts, and even young shoots. The food items that are most often eaten in the greatest volumes are um, saw palmetto, cabbage palm, swamp to palo, um, oaks, and other plant foods in the fall. I think that the size of their diet probably has a large incorporation as to why they get into garbage cans and become nuisance animals in neighborhoods. They don't have enough assortment to meet their nutritional needs. And so if they find an easy meal, they're going to take, take you up on it. So also the honeybee is the most frequently eaten insect um, and armadillos are actually a commonly eaten vertebrate. So they will actually eat vertebrate animals. So their behavior and home range, they're usually solitary animals, except for when you've got a mama bear or sow and her cubs. Obviously that is when a black bear is most dangerous is if she has cubs with her, do not approach her, give her her space. They are very defensive around their cubs. They can also be aggressive during breeding season. And that is a time when you will find many bears together. They usually have a um, home range of 66 square mile, miles for adults, uh, males, and the adult females is usually closer to 11 square miles. But when you talk about habitats and the fragmented habitats that our state currently has, these are massive home ranges. So um, very, very hard to accommodate their needs. Thankfully, Central Florida has got numerous wildlife corridors set up to help them with their expansion. 
Bears are generally nocturnal and most active at night. They do reduce their movements during the coldest months of the year, probably due to decreased food availability. But here in Florida, they don't truly hibernate. Um, bears may hole up until more favorable, favorable conditions. Um, they are true hibernators in that individuals have been documented to sleep for more than two months at a time. However, again, here in Central and South Florida, we don't generally see much of that due to weather conditions. One of the most common winter sleeping sites used by Florida black bears is a bed of vegetation located in a thicket. Um, due to our relatively mild winters, again, they don't usually have hibernate. Okay, so moving on. Sorry, guys, I have two kids here that are in the middle of going outside, so it's a little crazy. Um, reproduction. Black bears in Florida are um, more productive than other states. Generally, they breed between May and July, so you may see them together during this time of year. Um, they have one to three cubs which are born in January or February and they stay with their mother for approximately a year and a half. So they do take care of their young for quite a long time and the smaller their young is, are the more dangerous the mother bear is. Males do not assist or play a role in handling or raising the young um, and nor is there a lasting bond between the father. Bears are listed as a threatened species and they are protected protected by the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Committee. Their status applies to the entire state except for Baker and Columbia counties and the Apalachicola National Forest. So that's fairly interesting. Hunting the Florida black bear is prohibited through the entire state. I will say though, however, most of us are aware that in the last couple of years they have had um, specific times where they have opened short seasons on them, um, but I have not seen any information on that happening again, so we'll, I guess we'll wait and see what happens with that. This subspecies of black bear is specific to Florida and they are in danger of becoming extinct because of extensive habitat loss um, and not because of hunting because they haven't been hunted here in many years. Um, and they do need heavily forest habitats to be able to be successful and with the number of people we have moving into the state, that's not really a possibility. Again, habitat loss and habitat fragmentation is the number one problem with Florida black bears. Um, and also the number one reason we see um, so many different uh, problems with neighborhoods and the destruction that they can cause in backyards and stuff. And normally it's, it's minor, but uh, people are worried. I've had one call where someone's neighbor had actually shot a young black bear because they were concerned for the dog um, getting hurt. I guess they had a little small dog and they were concerned the black bear was going to come after the, the dog. And it's most important that, you know, if you have a black bear that is frequenting your backyard, first of all, notify FWC, but then secondly, give it space and remove whatever food source it's looking for. Road kills are also a major problem um, in black bear habitat. So, and bears can run fast. They can run approximately 30 miles per hour for very short distances. So, um, you know, if you do encounter a black bear, the best thing to do is to try to find a safe space to get away from them and just provide them their own space. Next, we're gonna talk about beavers. The Florida beaver is the largest rodent that we have, and it normally weighs between 30 and 50 pounds. The fur is brown with a dense gray under fur. Beavers are pretty interesting here. Um, their back feet are webbed for swimming. They do have a broad, flat tail that they use as a propeller. Um, if you do encounter a beaver in a natural waterway and it is slapping its tail, that is a warning sign to leave it alone. It is not happy or too close. Um, beavers do occur in North Florida and go as far south as the mouth of the Suwannee River. They're active at night. They can live on streams and swamps. Lakes do have suitable supply of trees for food as well. 
They may cut down trees that are up to a foot in diameter, which is pretty impressive. Um, and they eat the inner bark, twigs, and buds. Uh, they will transport limbs for building a lodge for their um, hide or for their home where they live as a pair and they will often have um, offspring in two different breeding seasons. So they breed twice per year. Next we have bobcats. Bobcats are very frequent in um, North Central and South Florida. We do get some concerns with them, especially when they make their cries, people get alarmed by them. Uh, the bobcat does have very sharp claws, needle-like teeth, and um, plenty of strength. So they're not anything to be uh, concerned about, but you should be aware if you have one in your neighborhood that you're seeing frequently, and especially coming da uh, dawn and dusk, keep your animals close to you if you have small pets. They have short stub-like tails, and they're approximately five inches long. Their tails have distinctive black tips. Bobcats do vary quite a bit in coloration, but overall are a tawny color with brown spots. Their undersides are yellowish white, and their legs are spotted, um, and they actually have a line that kind of runs down their back in most cases. So These cats can measure up to three feet in length and weigh 15 to 30 pounds. They're excellent climbers, so oftentimes, especially if you hear them when they're out uh, squalling or crying, they'll be in a tree. And they are widely distributed through most of North America. Bobcats range um, can range from five to six square miles, um, and they generally cover their territory in a very slow, careful fashion, very different than some other animals that we see. So if you do have a bobcat in your area, you know, note that it's, that is its home territory and it's not traveling hundreds of miles. Bobcat kittens are adorable. Um, I've helped with rescues on a couple of them. And um, the female bobcat can breed at one year of age and usually it happens in late spring or, or late winter and early spring and one to four young are born. Uh, they're similar to domestic cats and they have a gestation period of only about two months. And uh, two to four young make a normal litter. The newborn kittens have a full coat with spotted fur um, and the mom takes care of them until their eyes open and then she can teach them how to start to hunt. They're weaned at about two months of age um, and they are extremely efficient hunters. So. Um, very similar to domestic cats, um, and this is one of the concerns with domestic cats, is domestic cats will kill our wildlife, um, such as our birds and other small mammals, um, but the bobcat is natural, and so we like to, to leave it be, but it does hunt by sight and then again at night. Feeds on a variety of birds, small mammals, and occasionally um, white-tailed deer fawn. So when I have seen that, that's a pretty intense hunt for it. Next we have the invasive coyote um, and if you think you don't have coyotes in your area guess again we have coyotes throughout Florida and they're very populous. So um, the coyote was once strictly a western species and is now found throughout the eastern United States. They began expanding their range into the southeast in the 1960s, reaching northwest Florida in the 1970s. Um, and a survey that was completed in 1981 showed that coyotes were reported in 18 of Florida's 67 counties. Um, seven years later, they were found in 48 counties. And in today's world, we believe they are found in all 67 counties here in the state of Florida. Coyotes can be extremely destructive and they are the number one predator of your small household domestic pets, so cats and dogs. Um, they are most numerous in northern Florida, but they are increasing statewide in numbers. As most invasive species, the coyote is um, very adaptable, so it doesn't need a huge home range or exceptional habitat to be able to survive successfully. Um, they have been illegally trucked in from Western United States and released. Um, documented releases in coyotes have occurred in Gadsden, Liberty, Columbia, and Polk counties. 
um, definitely was not a good idea. So, and the people who illegally released them, at least some of them thought they were de uh, restocking the depleted fox population. So that is not what coyotes are. Coyotes are very different than our native foxes, and we'll talk about our foxes in just a moment. All right, next we're going to talk about white-tailed deer. White-tailed deer are found throughout Florida, um, all the way from the Panhandle to the Florida Keys. Obviously, in the Florida Keys, we have the key deer, and if you haven't been down there to see them, they are adorable. They are just a tiny miniature version of white-tailed deer. So um, very interesting species. Those are protected animals. They're very low numbers. But in this part of the state, we have whitetails. Um, they vary drastically in size depending on the quality of habitat which they have. So the food resources and shelter that are occurring for them. Most of our deer here in Florida are on the smaller range if you compare them to northern states. So uh, when you go further north, you get deer that are two to three times the size of the deer we have here in Florida. Also, we have issues with diseases in deer and ticks um, and other parasites that affect their populations here, and the limited habitat does not help with that. Uh, the average adult male deer is approximately 115 pounds, while the females average approximately 90. So again, this is very, very small compared to deer that you find up in north northern states. Deer are primarily browsers. They feed on leaves, shoots, flowers, fruit trees, um, the fruits of other ornamental trees, shrubs, and even forbs. Um, they are a problem or nuisance species in certain landscape areas. If they don't have food resources, they will happily feed on your landscape. Um, I live on a larger property here in just North American County. And I don't recall ever having issues with deer eating my ornamental plants here, but we have so many other food resources for them that it's just not necessary. Where I've seen, um, when I was in Flagler County, I had a client actually call me and the deer would eat her rose bushes and other thorny shrubs that had very little substance or nutritional value to the deer. But I guess if that's all they've got, they are just become less and less picky. Uh, because deer are browsers, they may damage plants, uh, planted shrubs, and landscaping. Fencing is an effective remedy, but it can be expensive in large areas. There are repellents that have some limited use, and I will tell you some of the commercially available repellents are just as effective as going to um, the grocery store and getting either garlic or hot pepper sauce and putting it on your leaves just to deter them. So um, capsaicin is one of the most common products used in deterrence and um, basically all that is is ground red pepper, ground cayenne, something that's going to be really hot and so once they taste it it's going to you know hopefully give them a little bit of a tingling sensation. All right it is important to avoid contact with fawns. We get a lot of calls that a fawn has been abandoned and um, you know its mom may have left it 99.9% .9 of the time, that is not the case. They are generally very wobbly-legged wobbly as fawns, and to protect themselves, they will hide rather than flee, and the mother will come back when it's safe. So if you do see fawns laying in the grass or in a shrubby area, avoid them and realize that they're waiting it out so the predator, which is often thought of to be you, um, leaves, and then the mother will come back and get them. In a week or two when the fawn is stronger, this behavior changes and then can flee with their parents or with their mom. Um, but again, don't collect a fawn that you see in the woods because you think it has been left. Leave it alone. Um, the female deer never abandon their fawn unless they are forced to by repeated disturbance or harassment. And again, this is generally by humans, not by natural predators. All right, a little more on deer and repelling them. Oh, um, just that, again, if you're having issues with deer in your landscape, think about getting creative. What do you have in your landscape that you might not mind them chewing on? Do you have enough space that you might be able to plant an alternative food crop for them? 
um, or some other food resource. These are options that you can incorporate fairly easily and that may save your um, ornamental plants that you don't want them to bother. Deer will also get in your vegetable gardens, so if you do have vegetable gardens that are growing, some tactics that we have found to be successful include putting out a radio or alarm clock that goes off um, periodically in the night. So um, we set ours up on a timer to come on about 10 p.m. and go off about 4 a.m. Uh, it wasn't on a large volume, didn't seem to matter what channel we put it on, and it was just an inexpensive um, little AM FM clock radio. Other things that um, might work are um, strobe lights or sprinkler systems that are motion activated. So anything that can spook them off from what you don't want them to eat. If you have further questions on repelling deer, don't hesitate to reach out to me and I'll be happy to get you information on that. All right, the gray fox. Adult gray foxes may weigh up seven to 13 pounds. They measure up to 40 inches in length and have a roughly a 12 inch tail. The female is slightly smaller than the male. They do have um, black hair along the back and middle of its tail um, and often have a black tip or uh, appearance of a black mane. Um, they do have some gray in there and uh, can be kind of hard to distinguish from a coyote frequently. The underside of their tail is like a rusty yellow color we have seen some coyotes that look appear to be uh, hybrids with the gray fox. Um, this is a nocturnal animal, which is um, seldom recognized, um, but it does have a yapping bark if you do hear it. I've never heard a fox bark like that, at least not a gray fox. So um, these are normally found in wooded areas and prefer to leave in, live in inaccessible cover. Their primary di uh, diet includes mice, rats, rabbits, and um, it will consume other edibles such as small birds and mammals, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and even fruits and berries. So um, it has a large variety of diet. We also have the red fox here in Florida. Um, it does have the appearance of a small dog and weighs 10 to 15 pounds and measures roughly two feet in length with another foot of bushy tail. It's a little smaller than the gray fox. The end of its tail does have a black tip, um, or I'm sorry, the end of its tail is black with a white tip. And again, it's a nocturnal animal. You will occasionally see foxes out um, during the daytime, especially during morning or evening hours. Um, I have seen fox dens right on the side of the road, and these are generally if they're in disturbed habitat areas, and their natural habitat generally you won't see them out during the day. Um, if you ever see a fox or a coyote out during the day, it is important to leave them be. Don't approach them um, because there is always the risk of rabies. But just because you see an animal out during the day doesn't necessarily mean that it absolutely has rabies. So, but it's always a precaution. You should leave them alone. The red fox is probably not a native to Florida except for in the northern panhandle. Um, it has been introduced by hunting clubs and is now found in many areas of the state. So much like the fox, or uh, much like the coyote, it is um, expanding its home range. Um, it's normally found in the uplands mixed with fields of weedy pastures. Again, this is kind of similar to the coyote. And red foxes mainly eat small mammals such as rabbits, rats, and mice. They're not nearly as diversified as the gray fox. Um, if food is plentiful, they may kill more than one and immediate, that they immediately need and um, leave the extra catch on the ground. I have seen this personally in my own chicken pen. Um, I had one fox come in and take out 27 chickens in one night. So it looked like a battlefield when I went outside the next morning. Uh, the dens are usually 20 to 40 foot long and roughly three, three to four foot deep with multiple entrances. So again, uh, with the red fox normally, um, you may see their dens very close to roadways. Uh, they are becoming more and more adaptable um, as our habitat uh, loss increases. Next, we have wild hogs. Wild hogs are an invasive species here in Florida. They may also be referred to as a wild boar or feral pig. It is not a Florida native, and they may have been introduced as early as 1539 um, by Hernando de Soto. Uh, they weigh over 
they may weigh well over 150 pounds. Um, some uh, feral hogs can get upwards of three to 400 pounds and maybe five to six feet long. I will tell you that at these sizes, feral hogs are extremely dangerous. So um, even the smaller ones will, they can attack you and you should give them fair space. So don't take a feral pig for granted. They do have sharp tusks and can cut you deeply. Um, they travel in herds, so they usually contain several females and offspring. Um, their offspring can be in litters of anything from six to 14. They have huge litters and reproduce very, very frequently. So they occur throughout Florida and in various habitats. Their preferred habitat is moist forests and swamps and pine flatwoods, but again, they're well adapted to all areas of our state. Uh, they are omnivorous, so they'll feed by rooting. Um, they don't mind rooting in your backyard. If you have grubs or some other insect growing in your lawn, you may see significant damage from wild hogs. They can cause great damage in as little as one night. So um, it really looks similar to a plowed field when they get done. Um, generally, exclusion is not possible, except for around very small areas of your yard or if you have a raised bed garden putting fence or electric uh, wire up can help they may be trapped however you may not transport them if you do trap them so um, you are allowed to bait them with acorns or old corn but again realize that if you do want to trap feral hogs you may not transport them live uh, trapped animals may not be released and um, even on private land at this point, the state has actually um, up their restrictions on it so you can't even travel with um, feral hogs without shooting them first. Wild hogs are legal game and may be taken during specific seasons in type one and type two wildlife management areas. However, in most of Florida, they are considered uh, domestic livestock and are the property of, of the landowner and can be shot or hunted year round. So um, with landowner permission, there is no closed season, no bag limit or limit on size for wild hogs. And again, they're considered uh, domestic livestock. So, all right, again, nuisance hogs may be trapped using pens, but trapped animals may not be transported or released. Not sure why this is duplicating itself, so hang on one second. All right, moving on. Moles. The eastern mole occurs throughout Florida. Moles are not rodents, and um, they belong to the mammalian order Insectivora. Um, that means insect eater, and this group includes moles, shrews, and hedgehog, hedgehogs. Um, the most notable aspect of a mole is its large, powerful front teeth, um, and these are designed for pushing soil out of its way. We actually got a good video with one of our colleagues over in Swanee County this week with moles in a cornfield. The eastern mole has a total length of five and a half to six inches. Um, it's very short-haired and has a small, uh, sparsely-haired tail of one to one and a half inches long. The fur is actually very soft and differs from most other mammals because it does not project toward the tail. The four, fur points up and can help the mole in their movement um, in their tunnels, so it doesn't help in trapping it depending on which way it's going. Damage from moles is common. You'll see these tunnels above ground. Uh, their fur is like a velvety gray color and they prefer loose, well-drained soils. Um, they are found in dunes, uh, high sandy areas, as well as rich forest humus areas. The characteristic mole ridges that lie just below the surface are foraging tunnels where they're looking for food. These tunnels are created as the mole searches along the plant roots for earthworms, grubs, and other insects. Moles are beneficial because they eat uh, mole crickets, beetle larvae, uh, white grubs, wire worms, ants, moth larvae, cutworms, army worms, and slugs. So um, be aware that they are beneficial. They just sometimes appear in places where you may not want them, including in your lawn. 
They may also help to loosen and aerate the soil, and they can dig tunnels up to 18 foot per hour. And when this is in your lawn, that's obviously not ideal. The living space in their tumbles, tunnels are chambers that are six to 12 inches below the surface. And the soil from these deep burrows is pushed to the surface in small mounds. Next, we have our possum. Florida um, possum is the only marsupial. Um, it's uh, The Virginia possum is what it's technically called. So it is not native just to Florida. It is found throughout the southeastern United States. They are about the size of a house cat. They have a long neck and tail and small ears. They occur in virtually all habitats, um, including HOAs and other small um, developments. If threatened, they go limp and appear dead, hence the name playing possum. They're very common in suburban areas and are most active at night. They're attracted to pretty much any type of available food, including garbage, pet food, cultivated fruits, and vegetables. Um, they're not super picky. And to prevent attracting them, make sure that your garbage cans are secured with lids that have either some type of strap or some type of locking device and take your pet food up at night. Um, possums are not generally a problem species. Yes, they can be if they find a food source, but um, they are a native animal and they do a lot of good for us in eating ticks and other insects that may cause us problems. You may lawfully trap, live trap nuisance possums um, and remove them and uh, relocate them to areas where you have permission. If you have any questions on any of the trapping or removal of any type of nuisance wildlife, uh, don't hesitate to either reach out to me or again, myfwc.com has excellent resources, but realize there are specific um, regulations for each of these animals. The Florida panther is one of more than 20 subspecies of cougar found in um, the United States. Okay, um, the Florida panther is a cougar that has a large round tail that is nearly two-thirds the length of their head and body. Um, we have get, we, we do get um, occasional calls that people have seen a black panther here in Florida, and that's usually not the case. It usually has to do with the time of day and the combination of habitat and the um, panther's body color. You can see they're more of a tawny color but they can also have a darker appearance when it's early morning or late evening hours. The Florida panther is protected. So they are more in South Central Florida, not so much in North Central Florida. However, they have huge home ranges and we are seeing more and more of them um, in the Northern parts of the state. Um, there are programs to help them with getting new kittens out and protecting of the young. Road mortality is one of the biggest problems with the Florida panther. And again, they have large habitat um, home ranges. And so being able to secure um, their home range with corridors is essential to their success and survivability. Florida rabbits are very co common. Um, they're the Eastern cottontail rabbit. There are two species that occur in Florida, but here in central Florida, we really mostly see the eastern cottontail. The other is the marsh rabbit, and it's found only in coastal areas. The cottontail is gray to brown, and it has a distinctive white powder puff tail and usually measures 14 to 17 inches in length and weighs two to four pounds. The marsh rabbits are slightly smaller and a darker brown color. Um, the cottontail prefers habitat of heavy brush, uh, strips of forest, weeds and briar patches, abandoned fields, uh, fringe areas on the outside of cultivated fields, and it has the peak activity is early morning and at night. We have a large population of rabbits um, here in central Florida, and they are very, very active. One of the biggest things that we see with the eastern cottontail is they will make nests in dense grass areas early in the spring and then when you go out and begin your mowing practices you may actually run over the nest with the mower so or if you see the mom rabbit come running out when you're out mowing stop and look for a nest 
Um, unfortunately, the eastern cottontail does not normally do well in captivity. So even if you try to rescue the young, they usually will die of stress. So the best thing you can do is if you do come across a nest in your landscape is to try to avoid it and give them some space um, and let them move on about their way. Um, it doesn't take long and they'll be up big enough where they'll move along and you can go ahead and mow that area. But again, if you try to rescue or rehabilitate them, uh, they usually don't make it. Swamp and marsh rabbits also utilize wet bottomland swamps and ha ha I'm sorry, hammocks. Um, these rabbits move about much more during daylight than the cottontail does. Here's an example of the marsh rabbit. Um, both the marsh rabbit and the cottontail uh, have a breeding season that is nearly year round, but mainly February through September. The young are generally born between March through September and have a gestation period of roughly one month. Um, there may be three to four uh, litters with four to seven young in a single litter. They do nest on the ground, so make sure you uh, keep an eye open if you're out mowing and working in the yard. Rabbits are strictly vegetarians. However, that does not mean your garden is off limits. Their main foods are green plant parts. Um, so this could be grass species. It could be ornamental plants. And if you have a vegetable garden, you may have extra tasties there that they are interested in. They will eat both rhizomes and bulbs, and um, they will eat young woody shoots if green vegetation is not available. Next, we have our famous raccoon. Um, raccoons become famous because they are very curious critters, and they get into places where you might not otherwise think they should be. They're about the size of a small dog. Um, they're generally noted for the black mask around their face and their bushy ring tail. They occur throughout our state and everywhere um, there are trees. So they often find cavity nests in trees. So your large oaks are a very prime habitat for raccoon species. Their young are very adorable, um, but just leave them be. Raccoons are omnivorous feeders. They eat fruits, plant material, eggs, um, small crabs if they're coastal or near waterways that they can find that type of resource, crawfish. Uh, small animals, and especially garbage and pet food if you leave those resources out for them. I always like to joke, um, I have one of the fattest raccoon in, in the United States here. He gets in my compost pile and pulls out corn cobs, watermelon rinds, and anything else that he can get. But he's my little friend, and I just let him be, and he waddles off after he finds what he wants. Um, raccoons are usually active late in the afternoon and throughout the night. Um, occasionally you may hear them squabbling in trees, um, but generally are pretty harmless. They can be carriers of rabies, so never approach them. And if you do see a raccoon that's behaving oddly um, or you're not sure, you know, just leave it alone and maybe call FWC and see if they have someone that can come check out the situation. Uh, raccoons usually um, result in problematic wildlife because of chronic feeding by humans. So again, whether this be leaving out pet food or they've adapted to bird feeders, they're very, very, very uh, capable of finding food that you might not otherwise think is available to them. Their natural um, fear is of humans. And so if you continue to move um, food sources closer to your house, they may continue to lose that fear and that is not something that is a good thing. Um, if you have a raccoon that happens to take up residence in your attic or outbuildings, they can be very destructive and difficult to remove. So again, prevention is key. Try to avoid having food sources out where they're coming around your home in close proximity. The next mammal we have, and we're finishing up here, is uh, our Florida skunk. We have both the eastern spotted skunk and the striped skunk here in Florida. Usually if you see one of these two species, they are dead on the roadway, unfortunately. They do occur throughout Florida, except in the Florida Keys. I will say they are not in prevalent numbers, though. We don't see them frequently. They're about the size of a house, house cat or sometimes even a little smaller. And of course, their tail is their most distinctive feature with the potent scent glands that can spray up to 15 foot away. So do not approach them. They're omnivores as well, and they may be attracted to lawns with insects, food scraps, 
uh, brush piles, wood piles, or other similar shelter. All right, our next mammal is our squirrel. We have several different species of squirrels here in Florida. We have our flying squirrel. We have the eastern gray squirrel, and of course, the fox squirrel. If you've never encountered a fox squirrel before, they are quite a um, majestic sight. They are endangered here in Florida, so don't try to um, take them out, please. Our eastern gray squirrel can be much more of a nuisance, um, and it is the most common. These squirrels all occur in woodland and urban areas, especially near oaks and hick hickories, and are active during the day and often found feeding on the ground. They will take over bird feeders, and some people actually prefer to put specific feeders out for the squirrels. Um, you'll see there are fox squirrels more often during um, the day on pine trees, so and upland pines is their preferred habitat. Uh, during late summer, squirrels may be seen rolling on the ground, biting themselves, and jumping up and down. Uh, this is usually due to botfly larvae, which are parasites that appear as bumps on the skin um, and in places where the squirrels cannot scratch. So it's natural. It's not that big of an issue for them. Squirrels are still hunted here in Florida. They can be a problem due to um, the fact that they will chew on things if they become common in your area. So if they, you see them working on an area that you don't want them, squirrels are very similar to rats. You can repel them with um, several different commercially available repellents, or you can try some of the capsaicin products, um, but you need to put it in direct proportion with the object that it's trying to chew on. So, and basically if they want it bad enough, there's really no repellent that's gonna stop them. Um, taste repellents such as your capsaicin products will not work on large areas or areas where it's impractical or inaccessible, like tall trees or objects that um, they don't intend to eat. You may lawfully live trap or humanely destroy nuisance gray squirrels without a permit or license. There's the difference though. This is Sherman's fox squirrel and fox squirrels are not uh, permitted to be hunted or damaged. They are in uh, protected species. So um, I have not heard of anybody in our area having issues with the fox squirrels. Usually the fox squirrels are very shy and are very specific to our upland pine areas. So unlike the gray squirrels, we don't usually find them in close proximity to our homes. However, if you're on a golf course area, sometimes that does have suitable habitat. Um, the eastern gray squirrel can find things like electrical wiring on outbuildings um, or even PVC pipe. Uh, pipe or potted plants um, attractive, so not always ideal, and you may need to use certain tactics to deter their behavior once it's started. The fox squirrel, on the other hand, is a beautiful animal and in very declining numbers, so don't mix the two up. And if you think you have a fox squirrel and need help confirming the ID, don't hesitate to ask. All right, next we have our pocket gopher. The most common problem associated with gophers is the large. Um, Sandy mounds that are deposited on the surface. Um, occasionally gophers will feed on the roots and tubers of garden ornamental or crop plants. And they do have a natural tunning, um, tunneling activity, which can be beneficial for soil aeration. Uh, pocket gophers do bring to the surface uh, container nutrients that are leached um, from surface soils. Their natural fertilizer helps maintain sandhill ecosystems. And the uh, soil, the loosen, uh, loosening of the soil provides needed germination for sites, including for some native plants. And many amphibians and reptiles actually use gopher mounds as their homes, including the mole skink, which is unique only to Florida. Gopher tunnels um, serve as a habitat for many unique invertebrate species that are found nowhere else. If you do have issues with pocket pocket gophers, there is a license that is required, so it is illegal to use any type of poison or bait. You may use a lawn, um, you may use a trap without a permit, but you have to be the property owner or tenant. So um, always check my FWC's website for further information. And again, you cannot use any type of poison bait or fumigant on pocket gophers. If there is a lawn service or pest control technician that is hired to remove 
Um, a pocket gopher, the technician, must possess the nuisance wildlife permit that is issued by FWC. If you need to find a nuisance wildlife person to help you with wildlife issues, there is a list of them on my FWC's website. Trapping is still the most effective method. So just to summarize things, um, threats to our wildlife here in Florida, our biggest threat is direct threats from human wildlife conflict, habitat destruction. Um, we didn't get into fire suppression today, but we can talk about that another day. And of course, road mortality. Lastly is disease, um, but as they lose the habitat, um, disease pressure and increased um, concentrations often increases. So. Um, humans are the underlying biggest threat to our wildlife here in Florida. And just a little bit on habitat destruction. Um, this is an example of an upland habitat, and these properties are at a prime for real estate now, and I, unfortunately many wildlife utilize them as their home. So urbanization, mining activities, and pine plantations are all part of habitat destruction, but urbanization is by far the number one. Again, road mortality, even in rural areas, is extremely high in all wildlife species in the state of Florida. And um, unfortunately, you know, we've all probably seen people that we've driven behind and actually swerve to hit an animal, and that's just really unfortunate. All right, so just to finalize things, again, don't forget about the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission's website, myfwc.com. You are welcome to reach out to me if you have questions. Again, my name is Maxine Hunter, and I'm with UFIFAS Extension in Marion County. Um, we have the University of Florida Wildlife Ecology and Conservation Department, which is actually um, my, the department I graduated from. They have fantastic websites there. And also our Florida Museum of Natural History has got a great website. If there's any questions, we can take them at this time, and I appreciate your patience and uh, sticking it with me today, and I uh, hope you enjoyed the conversations. Any questions? Yeah, Maxine, what should you do if you come upon a skunk? Uh, go the other way and make sure you give it at least 15 to 20 feet of space so you don't get sprayed. Generally, skunks are fairly docile unless they feel threatened. They're actually a very fun species. Um, but it's just out looking for food. So in general, I wouldn't bother with it. But if you have small pets that may be up barking or, or running at it, definitely try to get them away from it because it will spray if it feels threatened. Okay. And what is the, ex why is the exception for the two counties and the special park for the black bear? Okay, I'm, I'm not following you on that one. The special exception for the two counties? Yeah, that was in your, about the black bear that uh, protected everywhere, but not in those two counties. Oh, okay. In Baker and Columbia counties, it's because yeah. their um, numbers there, and I'm not sure the specifics on, I haven't done my homework on that in quite some time, but those two counties are very, very rural, and I believe their populations are very um, much higher in those areas. Okay. And I'm down in Palm Beach County, but I was just wondering, how do I get a list of the classes? Because I only have the one from April, and the ones from May just said to be determined. Okay, so we did put out a new list, and those classes, we'll, we'll repost them on Facebook, um, but we put them out on the State Natural Resource webpage. So, but we probably need to push them out on Facebook and other areas again. Natural Resource, okay, yes. lovely, thank you. Yes. Great presentation. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? I see one chat here, let's see. Um, so Sharon asked, do you recommend attracting bats? Um, yes, if you're looking for um, wildlife that do good in your area, bat houses are a wonderful way to um, attract bats and we we'll would be happy to send you some information on that. The specifications for bat houses are very specific. Um, you can buy commercial bat houses, um, but yes, they will help feed on insects that you may not want around. They are a beneficial species and they are um, suffering from habitat loss. If you are putting up bat houses, make sure that it's in an open area and post it at least uh, 10 to 15 foot high in the air. They do have unique specifications, but again, we have publications that outline all of that. So thank you for that question. Any further questions? All right, guys. Well, thank you again for attending today. We had a small group, but we'll get this posted as well 
Um, so we will get it transferred into YouTube and be able to post it on our state website. So um, thanks so much for your time today and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon. Maxine, how do you access the state website? What do you go to? So um, I would go to um, Florida Master Gardener and I can look and see exactly what that site is here. Trying to minimize my screen here. Sorry, guys. There we go. Okay, let me pull this up and I'll give you the direct website. Brilliant. Okay, so the State Master Gardener website is gardening solutions. Yeah. IFAS. Dot UFL dot edu forward slash master garden. I'm going to put it in the uh, chat box here. Brilliant. Great stuff. Listen, you did brilliant with the kids and everything. And we so enjoy your, your presentation. So much information. You give us like three or four hours of research afterwards. Awesome. It's Thank really you. good. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, guys. Bye bye. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.